You are listening to episode 40 of Paz de Chipotle. I'm your host, Rocío Carvajal, food history writer, cook and author. And on this podcast, I explore the gastronomic traditions of Mexico and bring together the voices of cooks, authors and entrepreneurs who build cross-cultural bridges around the world championing Mexican food. To find more information about the podcast, go to pazitipotle.com. You can listen and subscribe on iTunes, Player FM, Stitcher, Google Play and YouTube. Hello and welcome to episode 40 of Positive Utley. I want to take a moment to thank each and every one of you for following this journey. Maybe you started listening from episode one or maybe you just discovered it. Whichever is the case, thank you for being part of this. From the very first episode that aired back in um, 2017, I've had so far 17 guests and counting and have presented dozens of stories about ingredients, traditions and celebrations behind Mexico's grand culinary heritage. And to celebrate this milestone, this episode is all about one of Mexico's most celebrated artists and incredibly multidimensional woman that was Frida Kahlo. Perhaps more than any Latin American artist, Frida has been embraced worldwide as an unexpected poster child of dissidence, sexual liberation, radical feminism, fashion icon turned popular culture cliché and, I guess, textbook case of extreme cultural appropriation. I mean, just trying to understand that will force you to write a postdoctoral dissertation trying to discern the social interpretations of Frida. But don't worry, this is not the case, and I took a very different avenue. So I sat down with anthropologist Suzanne Barbesat, author of the bestseller book Frida Kahlo at Home, to talk about the intimate life of Frida Kahlo the daughter, the stepmother and wife, and how she transformed all the spaces around her into an extension of her creativity, and found even in food a way to express her mischievous sense of humour and passion for life. After completing her studies in anthropology in her native Montreal, Canada, Suzanne embarked on a series of travels pursuing her interests in different Latin American cultures, until eventually she set foot in Oaxaca, where she found her place in the world. A life-changing opportunity presented itself in the form of an offer to write a book that would eventually become an international bestseller. Frida Kahlo at Home is indeed a gateway to explore Frida's world and her personal life in an intimate and compelling way. Throughout the episode, we make many references to the famous Casa Azul, that is, the Blue House, now the Frida Kahlo Museum in Mexico City. We also talk about Frida's artwork and people and places key to her life which is why I prepared a long blog post with photographs, links and many resources that are part of this special episode. I also put together a biography of Frida and of course you can also enjoy the YouTube version of this episode that contains even more extra material. The subscribers to my newsletter already had had an early access to my latest book reviews, including, of course, Frida Kahlo at Home and Frida's Fiestas. But you can head to my website and click on the tab Books for Cooks to read all about them. And while you're at it, well, sign up to my mailing list because it's absolutely free, so you won't miss anything. Okay, I will stop now and let you enjoy this episode. Hello, Susan, and welcome to Paz de podcast. It is amazing to have you here to talk about one of the world's most iconic and recognizable artists in the world, and indeed a national treasure of Mexico, that is Frida Kahlo. Welcome to the show. 
Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very happy to talk with you today. Well, let's make the most of our time because we have a lot to go through. Thinking about the name of Rita, just evoking that she has become so associated with a plethora of things that go from political activism, Latin American and folk art, power dressing, sexuality, jewelry, unibrow, and endless memorabilia. I, You know, it's so much so uh, that she's associated to all these things um, and all these labels that have been put on her that maybe the person behind it all is a bit lost and a bit overseen or simplified and in many ways overinterpreted, I think. So today I want to explore with you the human side of Frida, to see what's beyond the myth. Uh, Frida the daughter, um, you know, Frida the stepmother, the friend, the wife, and the woman who, above all things, she really loved life. So let's start with Frida's early life. And I would like you to talk about what kind of family was uh, the Calo Calderon household. And what was Frida's childhood like at the iconic Casa Azul? in Coyoacán, Mexico. Well, <clears throat> Frida's mother, Matilde Calderón, was Mexican, and her father, Guillermo Calo, was an immigrant from Germany. So he'd been married before, but his wife died giving birth to their second child. So shortly after that, he married Frida's mother. Now, he worked as a photographer, and he got some important commissions from the government to document Mexico's architectural treasures. So it was thanks to that work that they were able to purchase the plot of land in Coyoacán and build their home. So they had two more daughters, and then they had a son who died in infancy before Frida was born. And then just less than a year later, Frida's youngest sister, Christina, was born. But then, so uh, Frida was born in 1907, and the Mexican Revolution began when Frida was just three years old. With that, her father's commissions from the government ceased, and then they fell on hard times. When the revolution started, things became more difficult during that time. And then when Frida was six, she contracted polio. So she was quite ill for a long time and spent a lot of time alone. Her right leg never grew as much as her left because of her illness. And so that created some health problems that would be an issue for her all her life. In terms of her personality, I think she was spunky and rebellious and she didn't really feel like she fit in with her sisters. She had a close relationship with her father and he encouraged her a lot in academics and in art. Her mother was more conservative and religious so their relationship was more difficult. I can imagine they probably butted heads a lot. So we talk about the iconic Casa Azul which is located in the town that has been eaten somehow by the city of Mexico, but in, you know, in pre-Colombian Mexico even, Coyoacán was a whole different town in itself. Back then it was like, you know, the outskirts of Mexico City. They would travel by horse-drawn trolley, and then later there were buses and mechanical trolleys. It was a separate village, like you say, with its church. It was an ancient community, but I guess as Mexico City was expanding during the presidency of Porfirio Diaz, there was economic growth. So the city was kind of booming and growing. And so a lot of people mm -hmm. wanted to live outside of the hustle and bustle. Moving to Coyoacán, it became sort of a trendy residential area, maybe. <laughs> I think also the very fact Frida grew up in Coyoacán and then as we will find out in the interview, continued very attached to that property. Just being sort of outside Mexico City in many ways, maybe that gave her that perspective. Time to retreat where the pace was always slow. And in many ways, probably that would have been like a seed that would give her this different appreciation of life, the meaning of relationships in the city and outside the city as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. But you will tell us more because with the thorough and very extensive research that you have done about the Blue House, I think not only was like the proverbial her spiritual home where she developed her art, in many ways I think it was like another character itself in, in the narrative of her life. Yeah. Yeah, a place of safety, of contention, a healing space. But it also became a space of confinement after the accident she suffered. And again, scenario 
Brazil for her very active social life and her very passionate love life as well. Tell us, Suzanne, a bit more about the history of the property, how it evolved, how Frida and her family continue transforming this space to meet her many needs and changes in life. Mm-hmm. Well, um, Frida's parents purchased that property in Coyoacan shortly before she was born. At that time, it was a piece of land that they bought was 1,200 square meters, so much, much smaller than what we see now when we go to the Frida Kahlo Museum. Like I said, it was just a, a fraction of the size of the property now, but it originally had a traditional Mexican floor plan with a central patio and the rooms around it in a horseshoe pattern. Most likely at that time, it wasn't painted blue, like we're, um, you know, the iconic blue color that it is now. It was probably a, a light color, possibly cream. From the old black and white photos, it's hard to say, but it looks much lighter than the dark blue that we know it for now. So then, like I mentioned that the Kahlo family had difficulties financially, you know, with the start of the Mexican Revolution and then with Frida's health problems. So they got a mortgage on their home. But then when Frida married Diego, he paid off the mortgage and he transferred the property to her name. But her parents continued living there. Shortly after they were married, Frida and Diego went to the United States and they were living there for a few years. And while they were away, Juan O'Gorman, who was a friend of theirs, was an architect and an artist also, he designed and had built their house studios in San Angel. And that's where they lived when they returned from the United States. Leon Trotsky and his wife came. So they, they arrived in 1937. So Frida and Diego at that time were living in San Angel and Trotsky and his wife came to stay at the Blue House. Before their arrival, they made a lot of modifications to the house um, mm-hmm. for security mainly. It was around that time that Diego purchased one of the adjoining properties and sort of expanded the garden and they put iron grills on the windows, you know, trying to make it safer for Trotsky because because he was worried about being attacked. and But then it was after Frida and Diego divorced that she moved back to the house. And then when they remarried, he came and lived there with her also, though he kept the studio in San Angel. So he was sort of back and forth between the two homes. And she was there permanently for the rest of her life. Well, except when she traveled to Europe. But when she was in Mexico, she was staying at the Blue House. So it was after their remarriage, they bought another property to the east, expanding the property even more. And at that time, they built the pyramid that's in the yard that holds uh, items from Diego's collection of pre-Hispanic art. It originally had a palapa roof over it, but that it no longer has a roof on it now. And then in the mid 40s, they did some more modifications to the home. So they renovated it and expanded it, added a new wing with Frida's second floor studio. They added an additional bedroom and a bathroom and a new terrace on, on that side too. So a lot of changes to the home at that time, adding volcanic rock and mosaic decorations on the outside. So that was really a project of Diego and Juan O'Gorman. Uh, unfortunately, Frida wasn't able to enjoy her new studio space for very long because her health declined after that and she passed away in 1954 so just after her 47th birthday but then after her death Diego left the house and all of its contents to the Mexican people in a trust held by the Bank of Mexico shortly after that they made the house into a museum so it was the poet Carlos Pellicer he was a, a close friend of Frida's. He was entrusted with the task of changing it from a home into a museum. So at that time, they moved a lot of things around, making them, you know, more visible for people who were visiting. And also, they closed up some of the windows and doors to facilitate guests' passage through the space. I mean, the house became like another extension of a three-dimensional canvas, no? Yes, yes. It was definitely a work of art. Definitely. It was important, I think, for both of them to express their artistic leanings through the decoration of their home. Diego liked to collect a lot of pre-Hispanic art, so there's a lot of it around in in the patio and inside the house as well, and they both really enjoyed Mexican handicrafts and their house is full of that kind of thing. So it it was really, like you say, another canvas for them to paint on, expressing their artistic leanings. Even now, after all the transformation that he has had, ever since Pellicer took it on and then, you know, the changes he's had throughout the decades, 
you can really almost feel them around you. Another and perhaps the more emotionally difficult consequence of Frida's accident is that she was no longer able to fall pregnant first and then the time she did to actually carry the baby full term because of the many injuries she suffered. In the on and off moments when she stayed at the house and the final years of her life, there were also many other inhabitants, like permanent residents in the house, that were all the animals they kept. I don't really want to say as pets, really, because I think they were more than that. She treated them more like, you know, the <laughs> four-legged, <laughs> you know, <laughs> children. <laughs> Just have to you know, take a look at uh, many of her self-portraits, where we see the, Camito, the, the, the monkey, monkey and the deer. <laughs> so why don't you tell us a bit more about these yeah. other residents? Well, she had dogs. She had a few Shalokskwintles at different times. She had, they had monkeys. So they had a pet deer. Um, they had several birds. So yes, there were many other inhabitants. There's a story that um, she liked to set the table in a special way for the meals, but sometimes that she would bring one of the birds to the table to accompany them while they were having their meal. So the animals were definitely an important part of the life at the Casa Azul. <laughs> I, mean, I think it's a book for children right, uh, waiting there to be written. Cough, cough, second project. <laughs> You know, that's uh, like a big uh, window already into Frida's life. This very caring, loving person, like I said, like even having her own birds for tea, something not many people associate with someone that is like the poster child of radical feminism and I guess unintendedly, you know, LGBT trailblazer, which she really didn't pursue any path to become that. But she took enormous pride also in uh, being a wife and in being a stepmother of Guadalupe Rivera, the youngest daughter from Diego's marriage with Guadalupe Marin, with whom actually Frida had a really long-lasting friendship. Frida, all in all, enjoyed immensely homely life. Planning, gatherings, entertaining people, throwing parties. And just as much as her studio was uh, the center of her activities, the kitchen indeed was a powerhouse for her family life. Obviously, I know it makes great radio to talk about places without describing them. There will be images of all we're talking about on this episode. But uh, please, Susan, tell us more about Frida's love for cooking. And for those who haven't visited the House Museum, please describe for the audience this beautiful and iconic kitchen. Well, I think when when she was young or before her marriage, she didn't show much interest in cooking and the home. But very early in her marriage, she gained an interest in that. I think, in like you said, like it was very important for her to be a good wife. And interestingly, like you said, that she had a good relationship with Lupe. I I think Lupe uh, Guadalupe Marin Diego's former wife. I guess his first wife was in Paris. Anyway, Guadalupe was the wife before Frida. They had a a good relationship some of the time, but Lupe was kind of fiery, so sometimes they would not get along for a little while and then get along again. Um, but it was Lupe who kind of taught her to cook, because when she first got married, she was pretty clueless about all of that. So Lupe taught her how to prepare some of Diego's favorite dishes, and then Frida would prepare a basket of food to take to him while he was at work. And because Diego was a workaholic, he wouldn't stop for lunch, so she would join him on the scaffold, and they would eat together. So I think that was really one of the ways that she expressed her love. And then as she got older, she became more and more interested in house and home and preparing food to demonstrate her affection. And I think hospitality was really important to her, as it is for Mexicans in general, right? To greet guests warmly, to feed them well and really make them feel welcome in, in your home. You know, she would decorate the table for meals and it was, you know, an effort to make the whole experience pleasurable. So it's not just about the food, it's about the whole environment, the ambiance while you're eating so that it's both visually and, you know, tasty, you know. <laughs> After all, she was an artist, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So um, the kitchen at the Blue House, it's a very cheerful and welcoming space. It's so colorful. Uh, the floor and table are bright yellow and the traditional Mexican stove is blue with yellow and blue tiles and then the tiles 
cells continue in a pattern up the wall. And although it was common during that time in that social class to cook with gas, they preferred to keep a traditional wood stove. As many people in Mexico will tell you, food tastes much better when it's cooked on a wood fire. Yeah. And of course, they, you know, all they had all the implements that you find in a traditional Mexican kitchen, clay pots of all sizes from huge to tiny and wooden implements, spoons and molinillos, the wooden whisks that they used to make a hot chocolate frothy. And then there are the grinding stones, metates and mocajetes, no blenders at all. <laughs> so it's all the all the traditional things. So it's very cheerful and warm space. I mean, every time I visit the house, you just almost start smelling the food, even if it's not there. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it just yeah. looks so yeah. inviting and so, <laughs> so welcoming, like you say. Really. Yeah. When I think of those colors, like the bright, bright yellow of the floor and the table, you would think it would be too much, but it really works so well. The whole room is really just beautiful. <laughs> well, I, you know, I guess you yourself, Suzanne, are living proof of how the universal appeal of Frida can have such a profound impact in someone's life. You know, of course, you are incredibly sensitive to these things. You are a trained anthropologist. And of course, when you visited Mexico, and specifically the Casa Azul, you absolutely became hopelessly bewitched by the place and by Frida. And what it seemed just an adventurous vacation ended up in you moving permanently to Mexico. So <laughs> a few years down the road, you ended up writing a bestseller called Frida Kahlo at home. So as a book writer myself, and knowing how difficult and deep uh, you have to invest yourself in uh, research. You know, in your case, what did you find at the end of this process? Because, you know, also as a foreigner yourself, that must have created a different sort of impact for you to understand maybe in a deeper way Mexico and Mexican through these works. So what did you learn from this? Well, I guess I started with the hope of just getting a deeper understanding of Frida and the world she lived in. So I, you know, I had read what had been written about her before, but I felt like it was missing a lot of the surroundings of what was going on in Mexico at the time. What kind of environment did she grow up in? And I was really interested in learning more about that and about her personality and what inspired her art. And so one of the things I learned that I didn't appreciate so much before, and I think a lot of people overlook, is that her work was was very political. So people tend to think that Diego was the one with a political message and she was just painting about her personal life and her suffering. She was, of course, drawing on her personal experiences and telling her life story, but she also had very strong political messages in her work. I was already in love with Mexico before I started working on this book, but I think it gave me even more to appreciate. I certainly learned more about Mexican history. I had a pretty good base in the ancient history, but I became much more interested in the Mexican Revolution and the period after it with Mexican nationalism and the muralism movement. It's all very fascinating to me. The fact of being Mexican was so important to Frida. I learned about what that meant to her, being the daughter of a European father and a Mexican mother. And so probably her painting, The Two Fridas, really represents that the European and the indigenous roots coming together and being connected. And that idea really influenced a lot of her work. She uses the forms and symbols of both Hispanic art and Mexican folk art along with the Catholic religious art. So the forms and symbols taken from those different traditions, she presents a message about what it is to be Mexican. That's something that I really appreciate about her. Was there anything that you didn't expect to find out, surprised you, you know, made you put all things together? So I remember when I was studying the archive, there were some bases in the Blue House that were closed up until, I guess it was in 2007 that they opened them. So at that time, they found a lot of new photos and letters that hadn't been published before. So I got the chance to read those, you know, see the photos and read letters. I just really felt like I was looking into a window into their personal life, made me feel feel, I guess, like I gained more of an appreciation, a sympathy, or I could feel what she was feeling at that time. Like I remember reading a letter that she wrote to Diego during the time when they were divorced and just the way she expressed herself clear, but so raw. Like I just, I really felt for her and as a person, you know, like you say, you not just as artist or a, a figure, like I felt very close to her in a way. So that, that was a really impactful experience for me. 
for many Mexicans, Frida is almost like another member of the family. So yeah. ubiquitous uh-huh. to us that we see her around us. There's so much in her art that is personal and so intimate. Right. Um, that really makes you feel part of her family or like a confidant. Yes, yeah, that's true. Yeah, she had a way of drawing people in and, and with her art. Like I personally, you know, my maternal family, one side is from Oaxaca, where you live. I don't have to tell you how magical and complex this beautiful city and state uh, are. And Frida sourced so much of the inspiration to shape her personality, her femininity, which is a very interesting style of femininity. Well, now we would call it fluid, very masculine uh-huh. at the same time, which is pretty much how Frida felt and saw herself. But, you know, I would like you to explain more about these metamorphoses of the personality of Frida, the objects that she chose to surround herself with, uh, to dress herself, uh, and how she sort of grew into this image, because her life was pretty much shaped also by the circumstances around her. What made Frida Frida? How how did she morph into this larger than life figure she became? Well, I guess we talked about her home being a work of art, but I think she herself was a work of art. The way she dressed and made herself up, and it was very important to present herself in a certain way. And, you know, a big part of the reason she chose to dress in the clothing from Oaxaca, and you touched on this, is you know, so it's particularly the clothing of the women from the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. So they, there's this idea that, or a belief that the culture there is matriarchal. So a lot of people, you'll hear this, you may hear this repeated, but uh, it's not really matriarchal, but the women there are very strong, so um, they rule the marketplace, and they're very outgoing and um, strong personalities, so I think that's something that she wanted to take on for herself, because her body was not very strong, but inside she was strong, so she could show that strength through the way that she dressed, so it was it was a strong message that she was sending about her personal image, and that's part of her artwork as well. For myself, I guess my relationship with Oaxaca, you can think about it, it's sort of like falling in love. You know, you get a little taste and you you want more. I, I visited Oaxaca and I loved it. And then I, I came back and I just decided I wanted to see where it would lead. And I came back and I'm still here over 20 years later. So I love living here. Of course, you know, every place has its drawbacks. There's no perfect place. But I'd say for me, Oaxaca is pretty close. <laughs> I, I really like what you said about Frida seeing herself and her own body as an artwork Mm -hmm. and not being afraid of to portray what she wanted. I mean, in the end, we all do it, but of course, enhanced or, you know, by her artistic creativity. (laughs) So we all do it, but some better than others. (laughs) She was very good at it, yeah. (laughs) You know, it's so appealing for many, uh, for Mexican and non-Mexicans. Her image, aesthetically, is it's so beautiful and there's so much intention, I think, Mm -hmm. behind Mm -hmm her physical aspect and the persona she wanted to project to people many years down the road after her death and to our modern consumist world turned uh, itself around in the worst possible way. Um, Makes me slightly uncomfortable to see the cultural appropriation of the Frida imagery, you know, like being like the ubiquitous Halloween costume, like mm. objectifying someone who was so much against that. <laughs> I find it almost insulting, really. I think the risk of commercializing or simplifying overboiling and pinholding someone, and in this case, a person that gave so much to conceptual art, to political philosophy, uh, to feminism, to femininity, to just sort of boil it down to that, I think we are robbing ourselves from the chance to enrich our lives in a much meaningful way from her. What's your opinion? I mean, maybe I'm wrong and and that's fine. But what is your opinion about this way in which people appropriate her image? Right. Well, I guess when I was first traveling through Mexico, I would see her face around, but usually it was maybe posters of her artwork or on murals or street art, things like that. It seems like, I guess, using her image for commercial purposes has really exploded more recently. I thought seeing her artwork on posters or things like that, thats uh, it makes people curious about her, I think. And maybe, you know, if they hadn't heard of her before, 
possibly they will look into her more and find out about what she was all about. But it seems like recently I'll see Frida um, shampoo or sanitary pads or, you know, all kinds of products that have absolutely nothing to do with who she was and what she represented. And I find that sad also that people are profiting from her name and image and it's in a way that has nothing to do with who she really was. So yeah, that's sad to me and I I don't like that. I mean, recently there have been more exhibits about her, like there there have been a few in the US, there was one in in England, and I hope that people take the opportunity to go and see her work and find out more about her life and see what's beyond just that face that we see so much, because there's really a lot to discover about her beyond that. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) I'm not interested in being right. I'm interested in understanding more. And I think you are absolutely right. You know, many people, including ourselves, probably don't feel that comfortable when we see this hyper commodification of her. On the other hand, like you said, it really makes people curious. And and maybe everything begins with buying a handbag and ends up with people buying your book. Hello. Right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Being you, one of the world's leading experts in Frida Kahlo, help people find their way to Frida. How can they find more about her? Well, for people who aren't in Mexico, I think there are a lot of resources available. You know, there are many books that have been written about her, including mine. But there's also online. Google recently put online, made accessible, really high quality versions of her artwork. So you can see her paintings up close, but it's a way to get a a close look at her art if you can't go to an exhibit. Of course, the best thing is if, if you can go to Mexico City and see the places that she lives. No, obviously the Blue House is the first place that that you can't miss. And then visit San Ildefonso, where she went to school and first met Diego and where the muralism started. So you can see a lot of murals in there from different artists and Diego's first mural that he painted there. And then in San Angel, the house studio. I mean, that was more of Diego's space, but she also had her home there for a while. And and it's really a fascinating building architecturally, definitely worth a visit. And then museums in Mexico City, where you can see her art, there's the the Lo Torres Olmedo Museum that has a lot of um, Diego's art and I think it's the largest collection of Frida's art. Also the Rufino Tamayo Modern Art Museum where you can see the two Fridas. So that's very impressive to see in person. And, and of course, take advantage if there are any exhibits near you that you can visit. It's very uh, impressive to see her work in person, I think. Uh, yeah, yes. It's such a vivid experience. You know, I wanted to talk a little bit more about her artwork in itself. Let's think about one painting in particular, which is the bride that is scared of open life. The image, just a brief description of a little bride, she might look like a little doll that is hiding behind some fruits that are conspicuously open, you know, showing their inside, sort of very sensual. So what do you think she particularly turned into food to create many of her powerful paintings? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for asking about the still lifes because I think they're wonderful and they really don't get nearly enough attention because people tend to focus on her self-portraits, but she did many wonderful still lifes. And, you know, we think of a still life as just being objects that aren't moving, but she put so much into them. There's so much more even than, you know, what we see on the surface. What first stands out is the sensuousness with which she portrays the fruit. So it's all at maximum ripeness. And like you said, all of it open, exposing the inside in, in a way very sexual. Um, and it reminds me, shortly before she painted this one, there was another painting that was commissioned by the First Lady of Mexico, who commissioned a, a still life from her. And of course, thinking that still life would be a safe topic, she ended up returning it because she said she wouldn't be able to display it in the presidential residence because it was too erotic. Um, the, you know, the way that she painted painted the fruit was very suggestive, I guess. She liked to provoke a reaction, and we can also see her sense of humor in this, how she liked to push the limits of what was socially acceptable. Then if we look at this at this particular painting that you mentioned about the bride, I, I in a way 
we can see the bride is on one side of the image and then opposite her, there's an owl. So it's kind of representing a duality. Like we can see it as the sun and the moon in a way. In pre-Hispanic art, owls usually represent death. So in this way, like the bride is kind of representing life and innocence. And on the other hand, we have the owl who knows otherwise, but he's looking in the other direction. Then in the middle, we have all this fruit that's just really at its maximum ripeness. So in a way, you know that you have to enjoy it while it's there because it won't last so long. So we have this sort of idea of mortality that's in it. I think it's really amazing the way that she used what she saw around her, the food, to say so much more, really. Yes, the, the still lives, which are my favorite of her works, are so deceivingly innocent. Well, now, finally, Suzanne, I know as a lover of Mexico's history, it was a matter of time that you became also very tempted to share this with the world, which is why you ended up creating your own company, offering cultural tours in Oaxaca as well. Uh, sharing sharing with visitors uh, a little taste of uh, Oaxaca's own history, but, you know, in many ways also a very important piece of Frida's own sort of spiritual home. So, will you tell us a bit more about your company and your services and also, of course, all your social media accounts and entice the audience to get their hands on your amazing book, Frida Kahlo at Home. We will have links so people can read a bit more about it and of course buy it but go please okay thank you so my husband and he's from Oaxaca originally and he and I we offer tours here in Oaxaca through our company Discover Oaxaca Tours so the website is discover-oaxaca.com mainly offering private tours to visit areas of uh, cultural and historical and also natural interest in and around Oaxaca City and we sometimes do trips further afield we really love to show people the Oaxaca that we know and love also so people can reach me through social media on Twitter and Instagram. My handle is Mexico Guide, and I'm really happy to interact with people on there about travel to Mexico in general or if people have any questions about Frida. So my book, Frida Kahlo at Home, is a biography, but it has a focus on Frida's surroundings and what was happening in the world around her at the time and the different influences on her life and art. Uh, it's, it's available in English, in Spanish, in Italian, and in Polish. <laughs> I mean, there's no excuses. Get your hands on this amazing book. Thank you so much for your time and passion for Frida and for Mexico. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Rocío. I've really enjoyed chatting with you. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening. This episode was written and produced by me, Rocio Carvajal. To find more information about this project, please go to pazdechipotle.com. To connect with Suzanne, find more information about her and her book and explore all the extra material related to this episode on my website's special blog post. And I want to ask you to help me continue running this project. And you can do that by supporting the show on Patreon. You can become a sponsor of the show with just $1 a month. Go to patreon.com forward slash Chipotle podcast. Your support matters greatly. Go to patreon.com forward slash Chipotle podcast and be part of this delicious story. I don't want to give away much for what's coming, but in the following weeks, I will introduce on my social media the upcoming guests of the show. So stay tuned. Well, that's it for today, my friends. Hasta la próxima. <laughs>